Okay, welcome aboard to the first uh, provider podcast and um, welcome to everyone that is viewing and I'm very lucky on the very first one to have um, someone who's a hero of mine growing up who inspired me to get into charter fishing and uh, welcome aboard to legendary New Zealand skipper Captain Rick Pollock. Welcome aboard Rick. Thank you Carl, it's nice to be with you this morning. As we uh, are about to enter our fourth week of lockdown, it's uh, nice to have something constructive to do instead of uh, yield to the groundhogs. <laughs> yeah, well, it would have been nice to have you on the boat and be doing this on the boat, but um, that's the, the times we we're in. We're, we're about to you, Rick, and um, who are you spending lockdown with, and um, what are you doing with your time? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm in uh, Rotorua at the moment, and uh, which is... Actually, this will probably be the longest I've been away from saltwater for a long, long, long time, probably at least 40 years or more. So it's going to be, uh, an, it's, it is an interesting time. Um, we're pretty lucky because we live quite close to the Redwoods. And so that's a beautiful place with a stunning, you know, uh, forest and the big trees. And it's really nice. We, we're probably getting them in for walks in there most every day. So um, and my yard has never looked better, and my tackle's in tip-top shape. So I uh, haven't used the, the time completely unwisely. Uh, it's been some good constructive stuff come out of it, but I'll be ready to break out of it, I can tell you, Carl, and I won't be alone in that. Yeah, well, yeah, you're not alone. I'm lucky I can uh, see the ocean, I can see the Aldis, but um, definitely looking forward to uh, diving into the ocean again and maybe getting a feed of crayfish. Um, yeah, I'm the same. I've been... Um, Quite enjoyed a little bit of a break. Spent some time doing some gardening, getting out for walks, etc. It's good to have the kids at home instead of racing off on buses and driving them to um, dancing. Just spending some quality time at home and cooking some good food. But yeah, definitely be looking forward to um, getting, getting back out there in the ocean. Um, so Rick, I sort of grew up reading stories about. Um, all your adventures on pursuit with the likes of uh, Mark Kitteridge, Sam Mossman, and um, lucky enough to venture out with you um, later on in life with uh, three trips to the Three Kings with some family, friends, some of my good clients. Um, recently, you made the call to retire from charter fishing. What, uh, what brought that about and was it, a, was it a tough decision and what are you doing with your time now? No, it wasn't a tough decision, and I'm very glad. And um, uh, my wife, Lynn, was kind of encouraging me to retire a few years ago, and I really resisted it. I just really didn't want to do it. And she finally gave up on that notion and, and just thought, well, when, it, when he's ready, he's ready. And to be honest, I was ready last year, Carl, and um, I'd, I'd had, had a great run. I've had some wonderful deckies. I've had a couple of wonderful boats. Uh, had absolutely some brilliant customers who, who have turned out, many of them have turned out to be friends, such as yourself. Yeah. So um, I've, I've had a great run and uh, talk about luck. Um, you know, I sold the boat to a guy who really enjoys the boat. He's just getting great use out of it. He's catching a few fish and um, it's not a charter boat anymore. He's renamed it. It's, it's called Plan B now, not a bad name. And uh, he's, um, and uh, I sold it at a fair price. I don't know if it wasn't a great deal, but it was a, a good fair price to a guy that I know and liked for a long time. And um, talk about timing. I mean, I, I missed or I avoided um, the White Island eruption, which would have completely disrupted us for at least a month. And now this, so my timing has been absolutely brilliant. So uh, I look back on it and think um, I got the best of a best deal. Yeah, yeah. Um... I'm probably in a, a similar boat. Probably in my last business was very much um, international oriented. Um, there's going to be a lot of tourism businesses out there hurting, but um, I guess it's time just to take stock and work out as a country and an industry where where we go next. So you touch touch base on um, you know lots of your clients ending up as friends. It's probably one of the things that I, as a charter skipper, have really loved about. Um, Charter fishing is an occupation, meeting different people from around the world, and lots of those people turn out as real, real good mates. Um, reflecting on your career, what's what's the thing that you'll remember the most? Is it the the big fish, the the scenery? What uh, what are you going to sort of remember it in the years to come? 
to pick out one is impossible for me. It's all a big collage and um, it's all the, it's part of the package deal. And I mean, I, you know, I, initially, you know, I was just a mad keen fisherman and that's why I got into it. And probably indeed, that's why we probably most all of us have gotten into it. You know, it's yeah. a, it's kind of a, a way to make a living while you're satisfying your horrible addiction. <laughs> so uh, it's been a, it's been a great life. And um, I, you know, I guess initially it was you know, mainly about the big fish, but as I got on in life and kind of maybe matured within the business and maybe my outlooks changed quite a bit. And uh, I started looking upon it, uh, you know, I started noticing really more the beautiful sunsets and sunrises and the pods of dolphin and the whales and, and the activity of White Island. And, and then, and then uh, maybe a little bit more laterally, I started really kind of looking introspectively into my customers, who, as you say, uh, you know, some of them have turned out to be absolutely wonderful friends. So I've been, uh, I've been very fortunate and I look upon it really as a package deal. I mean, sure, there's some big fish and long fights that stand out and there's been some great things that, that really stand out, but to say one thing, virtually impossible. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I, f I find myself doing, doing that myself. Like um, one of the things <laughs> I love about uh, fishing out of Tairua is on your trips home, just looking back up in the, the, Looking back up in the mountains, up to the pinnacles, and all the different layers of green in the hills, and um, that, that's some of the things I love about being out on the ocean, as well as um, you know meeting cool people. Um, about this time last year, I stopped in for my first time at White Island, and um, that really blew me away. Just the granite colonies and the 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 potential fury of the island. Um, you've obviously spent a large part of your life out there. What um, must have been quite emotional seeing what happened there last year. What were the first things that ran through your mind at the time? Oh, well, I was actually on a long car ride at the time. I was heading up north, so I was in the midst of a seven-hour drive when I first got wind of it. And, of course, oh, I, I, was, I was really taken back. And initially, I didn't think a lot of it. It didn't come across as anything catastrophic. But with each unfolding report, it just got worse and worse. And, uh, and I... I was in the position, I mean, obviously not only knowing the island really well, I mean, spending probably 150 to 200 nights a year out there for the last 40 years. But I also knew a lot of the people that were involved, certainly all the skippers and most of the crew that were on the boats. I didn't know any of the, the tourists, of course, but um, some, and then when the first person to be named deceased was a, a kid that I've known since he was three years old. And what did relief decky work for me and used to spend the night over at the house when my son was young and they, they were great mates. And so it all really started coming to home. And um, yeah, I was, I was really taken back. I, I didn't know what to do. I kind of wanted to turn around and be part of it. I was glad I wasn't part of it. I, I was just beside myself. I instantly had a few tears when I heard about that news. And I probably went through all the emotions you can imagine in, in a matter of a couple of hours on a, on a, on a, on a uh, ride in a car. Oh yeah, yeah. It's um, definitely um, brings us brings us back to um, the forces of nature and um, what it can throw at us at times. And I guess you've seen that a lot over the over the years, fishing offshore a lot of the time. You're at the at the beck and call of nature and the ocean. Yes, that's right, Carl. And and one thing I mean about the White Island, I don't know how much you want to dwell in, delve into it, but but it's that that eruption is certainly not unprecedented. I mean, we saw many eruptions like that, and and I dare say even stronger ones back in the in the '90s and the early part of this century. And indeed, uh, part of the deal for us, many many mornings, we'd wake up to half an inch of ash on the boat. And you'd, you'd spend 40 minutes cleaning the boat before you ever went fishing with the deck hose. So, I mean, that island is, is got the ability to do that any old time. So um, what, what was unusual or sad is the fact that, you know, there were 50 people on that island as opposed to nobody on the island. Instead of just noticing the big, uh, the big plume of ash and, and kind of going, wow, look at that. You know, unfortunately, those people lost their lives and were badly injured. So that was the big difference. So, but we've seen it before. And unfortunately, as you say, Mother Nature being as unpredictable as it can be, it'll happen again. Yeah. 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 One, uh, one of the features, I guess, we've got out here is the volcanic nature 
of our coastline, like the Aldermans we go to, they're like a one or two million year old Jurassic volcano. We look down at Mare Island, which came out of the ocean about 800 years ago. And then we've got White, which is uh, still still very much active. You've, uh, you've fished in some pretty amazing places during your career as a charter skipper. Um, fairly remote places, so the likes of Ranfilly Banks, White Island, which was home, and um, Three Kings over the latter years, and I've been lucky enough to get up to the Three Kings three times with you. It's a place I think every every Kiwi fisherman's got to do their pilgrimage to. What what of the three, Rick, um, would you put as your favourite? Like if you uh, could only choose one to go back to and reminisce, what uh, which of the three would it be? And what, uh, yeah. what, what appeals? to you most about uh, that choice? Well, I, I, I've got to tell you, I used to take White Island for granted because it was close. You know, it's only a two and a half hour ride in the boat. Yeah. It's, we do a lot of overnight trips there and it was real handy. And, and the fishing is still very good there. And I, and I dare say, I think it will be for the foreseeable future. But I always used to think, man, I really want to spread my wings and I want to go further afield and indeed, in 19, I think it was 79, we made our first trip to Ranfurly. Yep. And then in 1987 or 88, I can't remember, we made our first trip to the Three Kings. So we started really spreading our wings and, and getting to these other places. But as time matured, um, and, and I guess indeed I have matured, I started really seeing the value of Watt Island and how unique it is in, in, in so far as not only a fishing destination, having some absolutely brilliant fishing, but also the fact that it is handy and, and it is right there and, and people can access it really quite comfortably as opposed to going to these remote places like Ranfurly and the Three Kings. I mean, it's a multi-day trip and it's a big ordeal and it's expensive and you've got a budget and everything. So Watt Island, I think, is a very unique place being so close to shore and still providing a world-class fishery. So I'm probably, re, you know, respected and enjoyed white a lot more in my latter years. Um, I'd have to say if I had to choose among all of them, probably the Three Kings. It's the most diverse, but also has the most protection. A lot of people think, oh my God, you're going to the Three Kings, you're going to subject yourself to big swell and big winds. And that's true. But there's a heck of a lot more shelter there than the average person would ever think about, as opposed to Ranfurly. And you're out in the middle of nowhere. And, uh, you know, your closest place is going to be uh, East Cape or Hicks Bay. And um, it, it's kind of a love, a love-hate affair at Ranfurly. You know, I mean, you can go out there and have absolutely amazing fishing and wonderful weather. But if you're out there and you get caught in the weather, you don't have a lot of options. Whereas at the Three Kings, you've got lots of options in relatively or very nice, comfortable conditions. Yeah, and uh, what a spot. 80 miles off the top of New Zealand. I think one of the things I love about it is no cell phone coverage. Yeah, <laughs> trips I've done, I've been there with, yeah, really good mates, family. Um, I think the first trip I did with you, my father came along. Um, we had some awesome fishing, but yeah, I think the camaraderie is one of the big things you definitely remember up there being out off the, out somewhere remote like that with a good bunch of fellas. And, um, yeah, so many, so many different options. I think one of the what real standout moments um, for me, I think all six of us were hooked up on 30 kilo plus kingfish, many of which had gone around each other. And uh, Zane, our decky, was trying to trying to uh, yeah, do the pursuit shuffle and get us all untangled. And um, next minute, we look out to the balloon, the balloon pops and um, a marlin gets airborne, strike marlin gets airborne, smashing a car and the, the, the goldie goes off while well, we've got to deal with the kingfish and the spool's nearly getting into there. It's unbelievable. I think anything... That was, up there. I won't forget that either. That was quite an ordeal. That was absolutely <laughs> amazing. Catch all of those fish really, really was fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, a, what an amazing place. So um, going to remote places like that, um, I think one thing that always struck me with um, your operation, Rick, is the boat was always impeccably clean, um, not only when we hopped on, but right the way through the trip. Um, the food was always amazing, and a and, uh, highlight for me, you know, not only the meals, but sitting down to cocktail hour on pursuit was always a, 
highlight. Um, had it spinning a few yarns after the day's fishing. The deckies were always really sharp and well trained, probably whipped into shape. And um, you are always very professional and um, made, always made, I think, the right calls or gave us lots of good options um, to help put us onto whatever fishing that we might want. Must be a challenge, quite often the turnarounds would have been quite quick. Um, how, how did you go around staying in shape like mentally, physically, um, and dealing with the pressure that must have came with, you know, producing the goods trip after trip after trip for so many years? Well, you got to love what you do, Carl. And I mean, I've been, so, I was so fortunate. Um, I saw a, uh, a survey that was done in the States a few years back, and I thought it was a real eye-opener, a real damning report, at least for the United States. And that was, I think it was something like 68 or 69 percent of the respondents said that they hated their job. Yeah. <laughs> and another 10 percent said that they tolerated their job. And it was only like 15 or 18 percent that said they liked their job. And I thought, man, that's an indictment on a whole society and an, maybe indeed the whole world. I don't know if that transfers to everywhere else. But I've always been really lucky in that regard because I love fishing so much and love people and, and being dealing with people that I guess I've, I've just been a natural at both of these things. And over time, let's hope that we all develop more skills, you know, with whatever we do for a living. And so that just kind of came about for me quite naturally. And part of it, a big part of it is really nobody wants to know almost what you caught on your last trip or yesterday. They want to know what you can do for them now and tomorrow and the next day. They don't want to know if you've got a stomach ache, a headache, a, a cold, or had a fight with your wife. They don't want to know any of that. Yeah. They want to just know what you can do for them. And, ac and accordingly, they're do that. You know, I mean, they're paying good money. They come out with, you know, high expectations. And um, the least that we can do, and I always thought, you know, we can't control the weather. We can't control the fishing. But we can have a clean boat, as you mentioned. We can have a helpful, friendly crew. And we can give 100%. And with those three things in mind, um, I think, you know, the vast, vast majority of our groups were happy. They, don't, they didn't always catch the fish they wanted or had expected, but the vast majority of them got off satisfied and happy, had a good feed anyway, and good memories, a lot of photos, and good camaraderie, which you touched on before, which I think is just a huge part of any outing, be it fishing or anything else. So it, it's really a package deal. And I always looked upon it as that, always looked upon it as being in for the long haul too. Um, I think anybody can fleece anybody once and you know, you'll know you never them again in whatever business you choose to be in. But I was always hoping that my customers would enjoy their experience enough to want them to come back again. And, and indeed our repeat customers, in those latter years, we had about an 80% re return rate, which I thought was excellent and spoke volumes. Yeah, definitely, definitely right. Um, so you've, you started back in the 70s, fishing um, out of Whakatone at White Island. You must have, um, over the years, you must have seen the fishery change a fair bit. I mean, I've, I saw articles back in the day of, you know, huge anchovy schools and um, scoop, scooping the anchovy up and stray lining them back to massive meatballs of yellowfin. What, um, what have you seen change over the years and where, where, what do you think the future of the New Zealand fishery holds? Hmm, multifaceted question. Um, first of all, we'll deal with uh, 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 the fishing in the, in the center of the Bay of Plenty, which is where I spent the vast majority of my time. And you've got to kind of separate White Island from everything else there, I think. So I'll deal with White first. Um, in those early days, it was unbelievable, Carl. I mean, uh, we didn't even bother with live bait for probably the first two or three years that I was fishing. We just caught small skippies and albacore on our way out. We got three baits out of each one, two fillets and a, and a frame, a carcass. Yeah. And the frame and we got the bigger fish. We used um, a 200 pound wire, 10 RO game hooks. And, um, and those big baits. And the fishing was just out of this world. And then we started refining a little bit, uh, partially because we had to, and also partially because we started spending the nights out. We just did day trips in that first year or two. 
And then we started doing multi-day trips and um, we didn't have the ability to go trolling for all these bait fish to and from the island. So we started using live bait, which was phenomenal. And, uh, but we had to refine our techniques a little bit. And sure enough, the fishing started getting slower and more difficult. We had to get more finesseful. And in, indeed, you know, you couldn't use a, a big wire trace and virtually what you'd use for a shark, we were using for kingies in those early days. Oh. So we had to use mono and then lighter mono and then smaller hooks. And it kind of got right down there until we got to about the early nineties. And a couple of things happened. First of all, our fishing was getting typically more difficult. And then we saw a preponderance of gill netting around the island. And gill netters were showing up um, principally from Taronga area, but we had a few local gill netters. And suddenly the fishing started showing some real stress, particularly the kingy fishing. And as such, we really started, we started petitioning the government to maybe put it into a, a reserve similar to what Mare Island has, you know, to where there is a total uh, ban of bulk fishing methods, i.e. nets and long lines, and then only a partial total uh, non-extraction reserve. And we were hoping and thinking we could get that. Well, that failed. In the meantime, we developed our own code of practice, which I think is probably well known. I won't dwell on that too much. That came into being in 1995. And I think it's been a, a fantastic thing to be part of. And it has given at least the kingfish population at Watt Island a huge break and a leg up. And not only do we not see so much or hardly any more gill netting in these days, but the fact that everybody there, all the charter boats and most of the people that visit the island um, appreciate that and abide by that, uh, that code of practice. And to this day, and I can honestly tell you hand on heart, that I think the White Island king fishing is as good now, if not better, as it was 10 or even 15 years ago. And I think as long as that is, is looked forward to, um, that's something that we can really think, you know, hey, this is a great move that we did, and we're gonna reap great dividends out of that and benefits for years to come. So that has been a really neat thing that I've enjoyed being part of, and, and that fishery isn't healthy. Um, you talk about the meatballs and the tuna, well, that's something that is completely out of our control. I mean, I've been one to put my boot into the commercial industry any chance I got when I saw the, uh, you know, the need. <clears throat> uh, but I got to say, our commercial fishing has had nothing whatsoever to do with the lack of yellowfin tuna in New Zealand virtually since the turn of the century or even before. Yeah. So uh, unfortunately, I'm afraid, and I, I don't want to be too much of a pessimist, but I don't know that we'll ever see that meatball situation again in New Zealand with the yellowfin like we did in the early later part of last century. Yeah, it's been um, it's been pretty good to see lots more yellowfin turn up. Actually, had a little rummage around my um, freezer this morning, and this is my dinner. Yellowfin ah. this season. Good so on you. Thought I'd used up all the fish in my freezer, but uh, there's the last little bit of yellowfin there. It might be sashimi tonight. I don't think. You and can... it lo looks like it's vacuum packed, so uh, yeah. that's the deal. You, you remove all the air; it'll last for years in there. It's, it's a great thing, vacuum packing. Yeah, I pulled some um, kingy out of the freezer the other night and um, froze that sort of the day I filleted it. Took the day after I'd caught it, I packed it on ice down for the night and um, backpacked in the freezer. Still had it raw when I took it out of the freezer. It's just just like uh, fresh fish. It was beautiful. Fantastic. Good deal. Yeah, so um, I think one of the, well, the great thing about um, our industry as well, Rick, is... Um, in the likes of Tyra, for example, I can I can sit down and have a really good gas bag with um, Jason from Strike Zone, who is a charter fisherman as well, and swap notes. And um, one thing, one of the things I've really loved over the years is just getting on the phone and having a good gas bag to the likes of uh, yourself and the likes of Mark Armistead um, when he was doing it out of uh, out of um, Taranga, out of Mare Island, and swapping notes about the fishery. Um, I think it's think it's one of the things about our industry as well is a lot of people think skippers might be competitors. We're actually you actually need to cooperate out there on the ocean, swap a bit of info, and look out for each other's safety. Quite often, you're fishing um, many miles offshore, and they're, they're the only people you can rely on for safety. What um, what's your views on that, and how have you worked in with um, other skippers over the years? Real mixed bag. I mean. There's a few skippers that for a variety of reasons that I wouldn't give you a tuppence for, and I really didn't have anything to do with them. I didn't agree with their 
tactics, their philosophy, or almost anything they did. So, uh, but that's pretty much in life. I mean, we've had, we've got our friends, and we've got maybe I won't say enemies, but people that you just rather not deal with. And but I had other people that I would share virtually everything with. And then there was a, and that was a core group of guys that, and we got on extremely well. And I got to say, I probably enjoyed going up north more with the attitude and the skippers up there than I did in the Bay of Plenty, Carl. Um, the, the, the guys up there were a lot more welcoming, a lot more sharing and giving, and they were just really absolutely great guys. Whereas the ones I found elsewhere we were a real, real mixed bag. So uh, yeah, it's kind of like anything in life, you know. Like I said, I we I had some guys that I would just share everything and anything with, and other ones I I wouldn't tell them anything whatsoever. And then in between, you'd have people that you would basically share some things with. And I always found it was real interesting. There were some people that were really secretive about game fishing, and I always thought that was the most silly thing that you could ever do because these things, you know, an old guy told me, you know, fish have tails and they often use them. And I mean, for game fish and like marlin, tuna, that type of thing, here today, gone tomorrow. And I mean, sometimes the best thing you could do is not go back to yesterday's hotspot. Yeah. So yeah. it didn't really hurt anything to share anything about game pelagic game fish, in my opinion. Sure, a hapuka, maybe blue nose, a kingfish, and uh, you know, th you know, that's that's a different sort of a deal. I and mean, those are resident fish, and you either want to protect it for their own sake or you want to you know maybe be a bit selfish on that but um you know it's been interesting sharing information over the years and the different sort of personalities we've rubbed up against too uh, but it's just like life and i think in any business and just life and in, indeed just in general yeah yeah so uh originally rick when you made the call to follow your heart and go into charter fishing i think at the time you were one paper away from um, finishing a postgrad degree in psychology. Um, that was in the States. Have, have you still got family over there? And what, um, how do you feel about what's happening over at the, there at the moment? It looks, um, it's pretty devastating what's happening in the country at the moment. What's, uh, what's, what's your feelings about what's happening over there? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I only know probably the same as what you do. I've got a little bit more input because I have a brother that lives in Los Angeles and my son and my grandkids and that family live in uh, in Hawaii. So um, I, I keep a little bit up on it and I read everything that I can and we don't have much more to do than read these days. Um, yeah, they, they, they made the call too late. You know, I mean, we've been pretty proactive in this country and I think we're going to reap the benefits earlier than most other countries. And it's kind of, I'm really glad to be part of it. Even though we've had all these liberties stripped from us, I think we're gonna pay dividends and be very glad we did it. Yeah. Um, but over there, I, I, you know, I'm not even sure that they've you know, peaked yet. And uh, they've got a lot of pain to come in every which way. So uh, pretty devastating. And being such a huge country and not being proactive, I think they're gonna pay the price. And we're not, you know, they're gonna see, the worst of it hasn't arrived yet, I don't think. Yeah, yeah, no, it's pretty. Definitely feel very fortunate to uh, be tucked away here in Aotearoa and uh, yeah, feel for those people in other countries where it's, um, yeah, they're being hit so hard. Um, so your, your son, he's, he's not in mainland USA, but he's in Hawaii, yeah? You've, you've obviously um, had a big influence on his life. He's following his dreams relating to the ocean as well. Yeah, and, and he's gone a different route. He's he's the smart one in the family, I think. Um, he, you know, I always had to catch fish and, and do that, do it the hard way, and he's gone down the uh, road of marine biology. Yeah. And um, it's been great to see him do that. I think one of the things that was probably, he was always a lover of the sea, he couldn't help it. I mean, it, he's been a water since he, even before he could walk, you know, so um, in some ways he, he was kind of being forced into something to do in the water. And indeed, I got to tell you what his phone message is, you know, I, Kid Pollock here. I'm either in, on, or under the water. Please leave a message. And that couldn't be. More. I mean, one of those things is happening with him all the time. He's one of those three. But um, yeah, he's gone down that track. And I think one of the things was while he loved his fishing and loved the water and diving and everything to do with water, he also recognized the fact that he didn't really want to go down my footsteps. He wanted to be around to have a family and to be more of a father than maybe I was to him. Um, and, and, and be available more often. So he's really, you know, gone down a wonderful track in my opinion. And he's had some amazing experiences and 
even more remote and um, wonderful places than I've ever gotten to. So, uh, and I'm sure that will continue with the livelihood that he's chosen. So uh, he's, um, he's in a very good place, I think mentally and, and physically and logistically. And he's got a wonderful family, a, an amazing wife, and two absolutely brilliant kids. So, uh, no, I think, uh, and being in Hawaii, you know, getting back to your last question, I think just because of the physical boundaries of being surrounded by water, I think they've got the ability to come out of this a lot sooner than, than you know, mainland United States. So I think he's in a good place all the way around. Oh, that's, that's good to hear. it. So post-lockdown, post I'm going to throw a little little uh, scenario out there. You're heading out for your first first fish. Um, if you're going out there to target a, two species, one could be for the fun of it, the scream of the reel, whatever it may be, one of your favorite species, what would that be? And B, if you're just going out to catch a feed, what's your, what's your favorite eating fish? Uh -huh. Are you talking to New Zealand now? Uh, could be, could be anywhere. <laughs> well, my, my ultimate fish that, and I've caught a few and seen a fair few caught, but I, I think there's no better game fish in the world than a blue marlin. Yeah. And, and I think they, they don't even know what they're going to do. I mean, I, I've, I've seen two of them jump upside down. I still can't get that out of my mind. You know, J you know, their dorsal fins are in the water and they're, their pelvic fins are out of the water. And I think, what are we looking at here? But they're just so unpredictable. They're so such an amazingly acrobatic fish. And um, they're such a tough fish. And I just love blue marlin. So that's probably my apex game fish that I would probably enjoy fishing for anywhere in the world. And they are in a lot of places. So that's, that's probably the fish that I would be targeting if I were fishing for myself and for the visuals of it, which is a big part of it. If I was going fishing, to eat fish, Carl, I'd be going and catching a few tear. Yep. Yep. And how how do you how do you uh, like, I love how do you like to cook your tear? Ah, uh, probably the worst case scenario. I like to to uh, put them in breadcrumbs and fry them up in a bunch of uh, clarified butter and and olive oil. Beautiful. That's got the mouth water. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I actually enjoy fishing for Cherokee, not only because I like to eat them, but I find them to a, to a degree, they're a little bit challenging. I mean, certainly they're not going to bend the rod and rip line off and all that, but they're not the easiest fish to hook. And uh, it's most gratifying to get on to, to a bunch of them and, and, and catch a few. And um, they will never go to waste, you know, as far as I'm concerned. They're, uh, they're just such a wonderful fish to eat. So there's probably the two extreme ends of the the gamut of, of fishing you know i mean you got your little relatively small and um innocuous sort of a of a little pan fish and then you've got your apex blue marlin so and and you know what i like everything in between those two as well <laughs> uh yeah man after my own heart rep yeah I'm, i love seeing blue marlin go nanas as well but um sort of all about going out and getting a feed these days as well love Cherokee. um yeah it'd be right up there probably next to uh Maybe the odd blue cod, which you might catch in very similar spots, doing the similar thing as well. Yeah, and, and along those lines, I, I actually really feel sorry for anglers that are so focused on either a style of fishing or a species. And I feel that they're just giving away so much, and that's not what really angling is about, in my opinion. And I think no matter what you're fishing for, I mean, you know, if you're a, a coarse fisherman in the UK, you know, you, your, your apex fish is a carp. You know, that's the big deal, you know? And, and, and you, depending on what type of tackle and how you go about it, that's gonna provide a real challenge for you in a relatively unspectacular fishery. And so I, I see people that, you know, they only wanna use a stick bait for kings, okay? And they only wanna fish for snapper with soft bath plastics. And hey, all of that is great. But as far as I'm concerned, it's only part of the deal. And you can, you know, you can get a great lot of enjoyment out of any kind of fish. I mean, the best thing I think, you know, when you take kids fishing, you need to catch fish. And I don't care if they're piper, mackerel, whatever they are, you need to catch fish to keep their interest. Going. And you can make it so much fun for them. And indeed, you can do the same for yourself. Like you're saying, blue cod, hey, great fish to eat, not so great on the rod, but hey, scale right down, do it with the lightest tackle imaginable, and you'll have a ball and have a nice big bunch of fish to eat as well. So 
there's always ways to make fishing exciting and challenging. And like I said, I the people that are just purists in any form of the way, I think are missing a whole lot of what I, I consider to be the angling package. Yeah, yeah. Well, Rick, you've, uh, you touched on the fact you, you feel very fortunate to have followed what you think is your path in life and follow your heart. And I think I read in the, it's actually a really good article in the New Zealand Fishing News, a series of articles uh, written by Mark Kitteridge following your career, um, including one in the latest issue. Um, what advice would you have for someone probably contemplating life like uh, in lockdown at the moment? They might have even um, lost their job in um, what's going on and be contemplating what they do next. What, uh, do you have any advice for what they might do looking at uh, career options and following their heart or their passion? Oh. I, I mean, that's a pretty loose question. And I think it's, I think you need to, you need to be realistic, first of all, Carl. And um, I got to tell you, I've, I've, over the years, many years ago, I had in two different instances, and both from South Island, as it turned out, <clears throat> I had two gentlemen who had just retired and were in their early to mid 60s. So, and they're both fit, both had a lot of life to give and live. And um, they, we had great trips. And they were just taken back. The weather was stunning. The fishing was fantastic. And both of these men went on. They went home, talked to their wives, and ended up buying charter boats and got into charter fishing. And one of them got out of it a year later, virtually lost all of his retirement funds. And the other one drug it out for two or three years and then got out of it and lost a huge amount of money. And the reason I'm telling you that, I, I don't want to dwell on negativity because that's not the kind of person I am. Yeah. But realism is a big part of anything. So it's really great to follow your dreams and your ideas, but you also have to be realistic and see if you're able to do it. And, if you're, and that comes in many different facets. Are you able to do it physically? Are you able to do it financially? Can you take a beating um, uh, uh, in either which way and until you finally achieve those dreams? Um, and to counter that, I think, a lot of people really, if they're going to get into a business thing, they'll want to talk to a lawyer and they'll want to talk to an accountant. And if I'd taken the advice of either my lawyer or my accountant, I would have never got into this. <laughs> never. It was so negative, it wasn't even funny. So I just threw all of that advice to the wind and I went ahead and pursued my dream. Once again, fortunate because there weren't many charter boats around and I didn't have to, you know, I didn't have a lot of competition. So it was a logical thing to do and it paid off. I mean, a lot of work, a lot of years, a lot of pain and tears and blood and all that sort of thing, but it turned out really well. To get into the charter business now, man, I think you gotta really think very, very carefully about it because it's a hard road to go. Um, so that's, that's a dual fold question to your, you know, answers to your question. Yeah, no, I like it, Rick, I like it. Yeah, I think, uh, I think I've, I was pretty fortunate as well getting into the charter game sort of around it was probably the time of the last GFC and I had no no real competitors at the time um, so you know I was able to I was able to get into the business reasonably easy and follow my passion but um, yeah it'd be a different different story now with so many people in the game but probably one of the reasons I'm branching out a, in a slightly different direction with yeah things like this and our retreats and and um, yeah, setting up the property up the hill in Tyra. So we'll have to get you uh, get you here to Tyra at some stage, Rick. Love to host you for a change. I've been on your boat three times, and maybe we can do the next one of these out there on the water. Love to, Carl. I'd love to see your property. And, um, and you know, I've followed your career pretty carefully since you started up with Epic, and um, you really struck a chord, you know, with uh, fishing out of your local, uh, your local port and fishing in the Aldermans in a, way that really hadn't been done too seriously and um, i gotta take my hat off to you i'm not pissing in your pocket here but i do have to tell you that uh, i think you did it right you did it at a good time um you, you you know you followed your dream and i think now you know i think you know we were talking about maturing i think you know you've seen maybe the fishery maybe go downhill a little bit you've appreciated what's out there still and um and you're taking advantage in, in a business context which i think is great but you're also not so hardcore, you know, it's not like, 
you need to go out there and catch a boatload of 20 kilo kingies or a bunch of 15 pound snapper. You know, it's not about that at all anymore. There's a whole lot more to look at and it's a package deal. So I think what you're doing, I, I think is, is absolutely brilliant. What little I know of it, what you explained to me, I think it's great. Awesome, Rick. Well, thanks so much for uh, joining us on this first provider podcast, Rick. It's been awesome talking to you as usual. Our talks usually go on for quite a while and today's no different. And um, mm. keep in touch, look after yourself and um, hope, hopefully see you in the flesh soon. That'd be great, Carl. A pleasure. And I, I, I look upon it as really an honor to be on your first podcast. So as you say, I look forward maybe uh, another one expanding on a few more things, maybe uh, on the water sometime with you or maybe up at your property. That'd be awesome. Awesome. Thanks, Rick. And thanks everyone for listening in. You're welcome. See you, Carl.